and you should have control. All right. Can everybody see my screen? I can, so that's the only one who counts. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kiran uh, Gudukuntla. I am a consultant in the IM services uh, group here and focused on uh, NetEase Hub uh, primarily. And uh, in this session today, I'm going to talk about uh, Net NetEase Hub application services. Uh, that is the official name of the product. So uh, I'm dividing this into three sessions, actually. Uh, in the first session, I'm going to talk about the product itself, uh, how to use that, um, and what all comes with that. In the second session, I'm going to talk about uh, the replication quick start offering that we developed uh, for this product, and uh, that will be followed by a demonstration of uh, the replication using a lab setup here. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started with uh, the first part of it, uh, replication services. So in this, uh, we are going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, overview of the replication services. We'll take a look at uh, the architecture, and uh, we'll see what uh, the persistent transport transport system, or uh, PDS for short. Uh, what is that all about? <clears throat> we'll see how uh, how to install the software, um, and uh, what all comes with it: the commands, uh, the NPS commands, PDS commands, how to set up replication, how to enable replication how to uh, monitor the system, and um, how to um, use it, you know, for, for failover and stuff. And um, finally, um, how to do troubleshooting and how to handle failures and stuff. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the official product uh, name, as I said, is IBM NetEase Replication Services, but I might refer to it as just replication um, in the in the session. So. So the primary function of uh, NetEase replication services is uh, disaster recovery. And the target systems um, <clears throat> in the setup can serve as warm standby, and they can also be used for load balancing. So this product, this is a software-only product uh, that went live uh, last week of September. So it's been uh, live or uh, uh, generally available for a month and a half now. And a uh, few customers have already implemented it. Uh, so this product keeps a collection of uh, databases and uh, global data identical across uh, multiple NetEase appliances. Uh, I'm going to talk about what uh, why one standby and what global data means in a in a uh, in the slide for the down. Okay. So uh, this product implements uh, replication using something called a SQL statement replication. So using the in this uh, in this method, what we do is we take all the update transactions applied against the master a master appliance. Uh, by, by update transactions, I mean any DML or DDL statements that are executed on these databases that can change uh, data or global data. So we take those uh, transactions from the master NetEase appliance, so we, they are captured and applied on the subordinate nodes. Okay? So we do this for all update transactions, except if any of those transactions use uh, current time and date functions. So it says data, but it is date functions. So uh, in those instances, we, cap we capture the actual results of those functions, and those values are replicated. Okay, that is the only exception. And of course, only successful transactions are replicated over to the um, subordinate node. So this is known as an eventually consistent design because um, there are multiple components here. So first, the transactions have to be complete on successfully complete on uh, the master node. They will be captured and they will be replayed on the subordinate node. So there might be some times when the subordinate may not subordinate node may not have the latest data as the master. So it might be lagging behind. So if you uh, execute a query or a select statement on a master in a subordinate, you might get different results. So that, but the subordinate will eventually catch up because the, the transactions, pending transactions, once they get executed on the subordinate, it will catch up with the master. So that is what the eventually consistent design means. <clears throat> 
So this software is shipped as part of 608 and higher, and uh, it is also part of uh, the Genesis that was released uh, um, I think couple, uh, last month. Um, so replication uh, or IBM uh, NetEase replication services is introduces a new component called PTS, Persistent Transport System. Okay. So in, on the next slide, um, this is a uh, picture of uh, typical um, application architecture. Okay. So in this picture, you see on the left hand side we have the master node. Uh, this master node comprises of a master NetEase appliance plus a PTS associated with that master appliance. And on the right hand side, we have three subordinate nodes. So you can have one or more subordinate nodes. Each subordinate node has a NetEase appliance, um, twin fin appliance, plus a persistent transport system. Okay. Uh, important to note here is only twin fin uh, models are supported. Uh, skimmers cannot be used uh, in uh, set up, uh, setting up replication. Okay. So here, as you can see, uh, on the master server, you execute any um, commands uh, that modify the data, any DMLs or DDLs, so using your ETL system or files or anything. You, you load data into that. So that will be captured onto the PDS and uh, it will flow from the master to the subordinates. So from the master PTS over the uh, customer's uh, the, the van to the subordinate PTS uh, and the transactions will be played on, applied on uh, the target appliance, target NetEase appliance. So you could use uh, the target appliance for load balancing. You could execute uh, select statements, of course, um, so any replicated databases will be available in uh, read-only mode. So you can uh, potentially uh, deploy BI applications on top of that. But you have to keep in mind that uh, the subordinate may be lagging behind the master, so you might have to apply some filters on uh, date filters or stuff like that. I mean, if if uh, same result set, uh, sets are expected on master and subordinate. So that's uh, pretty much it. In the next slide and this is this shows a little bit detailed picture of that uh, of uh, what I was showing earlier so what I wanted to show here is uh, uh, that looking at the master side you have um, uh, a master NetEase appliance all the loads um, and SQL enter here and uh, this is like the wrong uh, the connection between NetEase and the PTS is not through a LAN but it is through a dedicated uh, 10 gig interface, okay? And uh, that is dedicated line through a 10 gig interface, but between PTS to PTS communication is uh, through the van. And important thing is all the right flow only from master to subordinate. So in this version of replication, it is only unidirectional, um, meaning transactions can go only from master to the subordinate and not the other way around. And the, you can have only one master in this release. Um, so uh, your update transactions can be executed only against one uh, NetEase appliance designated as master. So again, in this case, you have two subordinates and uh, read-only applications uh, can be used on any subordinate node. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is, of course, geographically wide. You can deploy these uh, sites anywhere. Uh, asynchronous meaning um, uh, meaning that these these can these can be out of sync and uh, single master write and multiple replicas for reads. Okay, now let's uh, let's take a, a deeper look at the persistent transport system. So this is an external server co-located with the, every node in the replication cluster, um, every that is appliance. So PTS has uh, three major purposes. So it is used to move data and uh, files, uh, what we call a transaction logs, from one node to the other. And it is also used to send control messages from uh, one node to the other. And uh, it also acts as persistent store for recovery from failures. So you, you keep the transaction logs there, so if something goes wrong, you can always um, 
uh, you may be able to recover from that failure using the persistent logs. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, in detail later. So <clears throat> the PTS management software is distributed um, to the server directly by the NetEase host. So it is, uh, it is part of the NPS release 608 and higher. So the PTS uh, hardware, it comprises of an IBM host, uh, IBM X3650 M4 server, and uh, it has a storage array, uh, IBM DS3524, and it also has a network switch, uh, a 10 gig switch, um, G8124 switch. So these three are a must uh, for any given PTS server. Uh, earlier in the development of this product, it was thought that uh, we could just recommend customers to buy their own uh, software, I mean, uh, their own hardware, sorry, um, using our recommendations. But now we are mandating that they buy uh, these components, the, ex these exact part numbers, of course. So the PDS uh, runs Red Hat Linux uh, 5.7. Okay. So uh, let's look at uh, the disk uh, space sizing in PDS. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, this storage array, DS3524. So DS3524 support, supports up to 24 disk drives uh, for storage. And uh, at a minimum, we should at least have uh, eight uh, nine, uh, gig, nine, 900 gigabyte disks with one spare, sorry eight 900 gigabyte disks uh, plus one spare. So at that minimum configuration with uh, RAID 10, uh, it yields approximately 3.6 terabytes of uh, usable space in that, okay? So important to keep in mind uh, when you design solutions of uh, how much data you want to uh, transfer over or how much uh, transaction logs you want to keep in the PDF. So at the maximum configuration, uh, it is recommended we have uh, 20 active disks plus uh, four spares, uh, four spare disks. So at that maximum configuration, we have uh, 10 terabytes of usable space. So that is uh, about the disk size, disk spacing. But of course, so the whole configuration and uh, uh, the whole installation of the um, host uh, switch in the the disk should be handled by an installation team. So before the services folks will get in there, all this uh, probably should be configured uh, with partitions and operating system and the gigabit switch and whatnot. Um, and the connection between the network, uh, NetEase appliance and the PTS server. So this switch can use, needs to be used only for uh, this PTS server and not for any other purposes, okay? Moving on, so as I said earlier, uh, PTS hosts run uh, Red Hat Linux, uh, Enterprise Linux 5.7, and uh, this storage array is divided into four partitions. So there are 300 gig partitions plus uh, the remaining, whatever the remaining storage is. So on the first partition, we have the operating system for host A, so in this release of uh, uh, replication, we have only one host. But in future releases, we might add another host for high, high availability. So we are dedicating a second partition for operating system for that host. So you install the operating system on the DS um, uh, storage array and not uh, the storage on the host itself. I, I don't even think that there is storage available on that host. So you, you install, uh, they, I mean installation services, they install operating system on the storage array partition. So the third partition is dedicated for uh, the PTS management software. And the last partition of whatever is left on the storage array, it is uh, dedicated for PTS data, for uh, transaction logs, plus as well as any load files. So uh, the the PDS software partition, uh, the third 100 gig partition, is mounted onto this drive uh, OPT IBM on the PTS host. And the PTS data partition, it is mounted on this directory var nz repl. So this directory var nz repl is also mounted on the NetEase appliance 
uh, at the same local mount point. So when you uh, refer to this directory var nz repl, it means the same. It goes to the same location both on the NPS and the PDS at any given node. Okay. And uh, the replication log directories are under var nz repl. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in detail uh, about this uh, a little further down. <clears throat> so uh, var nz repl slash one, which is a major release. Um, with node ID, that, that contains all the replication metadata. And with the ripple set ID, uh, it contains uh, the source directory for SQL logs. Of course, I'm going to talk about all this terminology down. So any questions so far? All right. Moving along. Uh, so this, hey, Kira, uh, I just want, yep. There is a question from Pravin. Um, it says, one PTS can support how many secondary servers at maximum? One PTS? So each, uh, at any given node, you will need, you need one PTS and one NetEase appliance. Okay, so one PTS server is dedicated for that NetEase appliance. Okay, so you can have one master node comprising of one appliance, uh, one NetEase appliance plus PTS, plus you can have any number of subordinate nodes each having its own NetEase appliance has and uh, each, its own PDS. Okay, and there's another question from Gary. Uh, that was, uh, PTS server requires licensing. What is the cost? PTS server uh, requires licensing. So we recommend buying our own components, right? So they, they are going to buy hardware components from IBM. Right, so there is a cost associated with it. Uh, there is a website I can show you at the end. Uh, you can go there and it, it uh, provides information about what are all the components that you need to order from IBM and the cost structure. And I'm not very sure if that is uh, uniform across the, um, in all the countries. But Red Hat Linux 5.7, they have to buy and uh, what are all the licensing costs for it? It is, um, I think, up to where they source it from. Okay. So uh, that operating system installed on the PDS would have to be supported by Red Hat or any other mechanism that the customer might have. So, but I'm not very sure about the details of uh, the licensing costs around that. And the support for uh, this hardware components, again, uh, the support, uh, standard IBM support. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so uh, moving along. So this is uh, a wiring diagram uh, of that shows the connections between uh, the NetEase appliance and the PTS server, PTS host. So on the top, you have the host one and host two of the NetEase appliance, twin fin appliance, and the bottom you have the switch and uh, the PTS host. So as you can see, uh, on each net is a host, you have you need to have two uh, 10 gig interfaces on two different cards, okay? And the connections from those two different car, uh, 10 gig interfaces will go to this switch, and from the switch, uh, these two uh, 10 gigs go to two different ports, again on two different cards on uh, the PDS host. And this is, of course, done for um, high availability again, and a failover and the, at the card level. So important to note here is uh, because you have these uh, 10 gig interfaces, uh, of course, these will be bonded, and there will be one IP address that you can uh, use to, to connect to this uh, 10 gig interface. So there is, uh, these hosts um, communicate with um, the PTS host uh, over this 10 gig uh, IP address, but with all other, uh, you know, apl uh, applications, you would use the normal Ethernet connection. And uh, same with the PTS. So you have the 10 gig uh, IP address as well as uh, the WAN IP address, which which uh, it uses to communicate to the other PTSs. So the PTS server, it has only two connections, one to the NetEase host and one to the other PTS host, and uh, nothing else, okay? So uh, you would use uh, P IP tables to um, restrict uh, any communication to the PTS hosts, okay, except for these two. 
So, as I mentioned earlier, um, Netiza implements uh, we implement a SQL statement replication in uh, in this product. So, NPS does not have a conventional record-oriented transaction log, or uh, you might refer to it as a redo logs on uh, Oracle. So, these are expensive to retrieve from the spools. Um, in the backup and restore, uh, NZ backup and NZ restore, they use that method to retrieve other transa transaction logs from spools and they actually replicate the actual values over. But since that is a pretty expensive thing to do, we implement something called a SQL statement level replication. So, as I mentioned earlier, so the DMLs in DDLs, uh, DDL transactions executed against uh, replicated data will be applied uh, on the subordinate. So the idea is that, uh, let's say you begin with uh, uh, identical databases on the master and uh, subordinate. So after that, any uh, statement that, uh, that is executed against any uh, the database on the master uh, should have the same effect on the subordinate side because it is the same, same statement. So that is, idea, that is the idea behind the SQL statement replications. So, uh, so they are captured and uh, it is applied on the subordinate, um, execute the replicated transactions in the sequential order of how they are executed on the master. So the sequential order is maintained on the PDS using something called commit sequence number or CSM. Um, so that, that is used to replicate, uh, uh, apply the transactions on the subordinate in the same sequential order as it was executed on the master. Um, so um, there is something called a lock table uh, uh, feature that we provide with this. And of course, I mean, I think it is not only for replication, but it is generally available there. So this is used mainly for uh, explicit transactions. So in explicit transactions with uh, a begin and end block, you might have multiple uh, statements that read and are write to the same table. So that might cause some uh, locks and uh, you know some deadlocks. So to to prevent that, you can use this uh, lock table uh, clause to to lock a particular table so that you will prevent uh, deadlocks or contention. Okay. So you could use uh, this log table statement to lock any uh, to get any lock on the table. So uh, of course the replication guide provides all the options available uh, for lock mode, but the default is uh, share row exclusive mode. Okay. So general considerations and restrictions. So because we implement uh, SQL uh, statement replication method for SQL statement level replication. There are certain, of course, restrictions and considerations that we need to follow. So the first one is uh, the configuration files, the system config file, the Postgres uh, SQL config file, LDAP config, and uh, other configuration files. They must be identical on all the net is a host in the replication set. This is because, you know, the, the, depending on the settings, uh, there can be performance implications as well as uh, it could be some values too. So you need to have uh, same uh, settings on all the appliances so that you will have the same uh, the same um, result set across the board. Okay, and all the hosts in the replication set must be running the same version of NPS and uh, PTS. Okay, so if you are running 6.0.8 or 7.0, you have to have the same version across the board in all the NPSs and the PTS hosts. All the hosts in the replication set must have the same authentication configuration, uh, it, whether it is LDAP or uh, local, it must be the same. And uh, they must, all the hosts must use the same uh, time synchronization software. Uh, typically people have uh, a network time protocol, NTP server, and you would uh, specify that so that they will have the same uh, time synchronization. So this is checked periodically to detect if the hosts uh, vary by more than 30 seconds, in which case you will be notified. Um, all the NetEase hosts must have the same identifier case. So this is the uh, default uh, identifier case. Um, whether it is lower or upper, it should be identical across the board. Uh, once uh, you set it up, once the replication is set up, 
you cannot change the identifier case on the on the NPS. And the last one is uh, if uh, you have any NFS mounts or any other mounts that you could use in uh, creating external tables that in the replicated database or any you can refer to those external tables in your update transactions. Uh, you need to have um, those same mounts across the board on all the appliances. Okay. And uh, there's a question. It says, uh, can I choose some database to be replicated and others to be not replicated? Yes. Yes. So you uh, the replicate. You can have a set of databases that you you can choose to be replicated, and that is called the replicated databases, of course. And on the subordinate also, you can have replicated databases plus other uh, non-replicated databases. Okay. So um, there are some uh, SQL restrictions, of course, because we are also, replicating users. One more question: says, can you sure. do the same at the table level, replicate a table subset? No, no. Table level replication is not supported. You have to do an entire database. So if you have any specific set of tables that you want to replicate, uh, you would have to create a new database just for those. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Mike? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. So there are some uh, SQL restrictions, of course. <clears throat> so uh, restrictions are uh, so if you have any existing databases to begin with, to uh, before you install and uh, set up replication, you have to do so before uh, you add any subordinate nodes. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to do that a uh, little bit further down. Uh, so once a subordinate node has been added. Only new empty databases can be created in the replication set. Okay. Uh, update transactions to replicated data or global data must be done only on the master node. So any update transactions, uh, when I say update transactions, it doesn't mean only update statements. It means insert, update, delete, or any DML or DDL uh, uh, statements. So for simplicity, we are referring to that as update transactions. So update transactions can be uh, executed only on the master node. And updates to global data is permitted only when connected to the system database on the master node or a replicated database. The system database is uh, not replicated. And um, update transactions against replicated databases can select only from repl replicated databases. But I, I think that's pretty intuitive. If you can have uh, in your update statements or insert statements, you can refer to other databases, as you know, as uh, what you call cross database reference. So if you uh, if you refer to a table that is not being replicated, those transactions, of course, would fail on the subordinates. But uh, the replication won't even allow uh, if it detects cross database reference um, uh, to a database that is not replicated. Uh, temporary tables are limited uh, to a transaction scope. So temporary tables can be created, but within uh, explicit transactions. So the scope of those transactions, those uh, temporary tables is uh, within that transaction, explicit transactions. But as a workaround, workaround you can create temporary tables in uh, non-replicated databases, selecting desired uh, data from replicated databases. Okay. So the last one is very important, the non-deterministic SQL. So non-deterministic SQL, what that means is uh, if you have certain functions like um, random, let's say you have a random function. So every time you execute a random function, it generates a different result. So that is non-deterministic. So every time when you execute the same query again and again, you will get different results. That is non-deterministic. So when you execute the same query on the master, you will get one value. When you execute the same thing on the target, you will have a different value. So random is a typical uh, example. Uh, current user, current, uh, all those things are, again, examples, um, sequences. Or you can have uh, any user-defined functions that can be non-deterministic. Okay. So there are, of course, restrictions on that. 
so some are inherent to support it uh, current date and time functions as i mentioned earlier uh, when you execute when you use these functions within your sql the actual values of those functions are captured and the values are replicated but for all other uh, non deterministic sql that handled meaning uh, there is a um, um, there is a setting that you can set whether to allow or uh, reject those transactions or warn you when nps detects uh, those transactions so a session variable so i'm going to talk about the session variable uh, okay. a little bit later was there a question okay so uh, any limits or sequences or any other special columns they can be handled Okay. So, um, let's our replication uh, introduces some terms. Uh, let's look at what they are. So, a uh, replication node is a combination of uh, let's our appliance and a PDS host, and a replication set is a collection of replication nodes replicating one or more dat replicated databases and global data from master to subordinate. and a net is a host can be a member of only one replication set uh in this uh, release of course and of course in one uh, one setup you can have only one replication set at the moment a uh, replicated database is any database that will be replicated from the master onto the subordinate nodes and a replication log is uh, the replicated transaction sequel and other data captured on the master replication host and stored by the pds for replay on the subordinate replication hosts global data means uh, users groups global privileges and uh, other security objects and uh, i mentioned this earlier uh, any up update transactions mean any modification to global or replicated data so it can be either ddl or dml or grants or create user or any other statements like that asynchronous replication means update transactions commit uh, at the master and then propagated to the subordinates okay queries at a subordinate may see data that lags the master so i referred to this earlier uh, because there is a lag and uh, there is a latency uh, if you let's say you load some data on the master it takes some time to go over the van over to the subordinate and it has to be loaded so there is some latency there that is why it is uh, asynchronous so any questions so far that is uh, pretty much the overview of uh, the terms and the architecture of replication a uh, quick question sure does the pts do batch applying to the, st the secondary node I'm sorry I did not understand. Can you repeat that? The PTS server collects transactions off the primary and then applies them to the secondary. Right. Uh, is this done in batches? No, it is uh, done as it goes uh, sequentially. So the transactions uh, are captured on the master PTS and moved over to the subordinate PTS. Right? So it pulls every few minutes uh, every few uh, there is some time interval at which uh, it pulls and all the transactions committed in that time interval will be moved over to the subordinate node but okay. there will be uh, if you load any data right so the if you let's say you load from an external file so that file also will be moved over to the subordinate pts and that happens through some um, a file transfer mechanism but the transactions will go to the subordinate pts but they will be executed only in that commit uh, using that commit sequence number in that sequential order okay thanks okay any other questions guys okay so before we go to install uh, the <coughs> uh, the pts uh, management software on the pts course there are certain things that we need to check uh, as i mentioned earlier the version of nps running on the master and the subordinate nps nodes has to be the same and of course it has to be uh, 608 or higher and uh, if it is not of course the first thing we need to do is uh, upgrade the nps on the on all the nodes 
Second thing we need to check is uh, that the var in the ripple directory from the PTS server is mounted onto the NPS. Uh, again, uh, this is something that installation services uh, does, uh, but we just have to double check that. Uh, one other quick question. Sure. You've got the master and the secondary PTS. What happens if the secondary loses communication and the master fills? Right. So I'm going to talk about all those uh, scenarios uh, of w what needs to be done in those scenarios. Uh, right. There are certain commands that you need to execute to, to recover that. I'm going to talk okay. about that in uh, in detail a little bit later. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. there, there's also another question that says, are there any predefined procedures that check data consistency, for example, using checksums? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are tools available. Uh, again, um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in uh, detail further, okay? So uh, when customers purchase a uh, replication from Netiza, they will get a license file. Uh, the license file is called a REPL affirmation file, and uh, this has to go in a particular directory uh, on the NPS host and all the NPS hosts. Uh, if you do not have uh, the replication affirmation file, replication cannot be enabled. And if you cannot find it, you have to contact the sales team who can uh, give you that file. Uh, and you have to uh, get the connection details from um, the customer for all the NPS and PTS uh, hosts, uh, which means all the host names and IP addresses for 10 gig interfaces and Ethernet interfaces. Uh, so if a customer chooses to uh, uh, hire our uh, services, I have prepared something called a quick start uh, pre-engagement checklist that uh, asks all these questions from the customer. So they fill this out and they, they give it to us uh, in advance so we can have this as a reference and uh, we can see if uh, anything is missing. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, so PDS uh, runs RHEL 5, 5.7 or higher, and uh, you can check the version of uh, Red Hat running using that command cat uh, it's the issue. So, in, of course, it should be, they should be installing 5.7, but it's just good to double check, okay? And uh, for file transfer and other purposes, uh, the PTS uh, also has a Linux account called NZ, and the user UID and the GID of the NZ host must match between NPS and uh, PTS host in any given node, okay? So to check that UID and GID, um, you can look at the cat uh, SC password, and you can see the UID and GID to make sure that it matches between NPS and PTS. So now that we have checked <coughs> all those uh, things, uh, we are ready to install the PTS management software. And as I mentioned, uh, the installables are shipped as part of uh, NPS 608 or higher. Uh, those installables are in this directory NZ kit PTS. So the first step is to copy these two files, pts.tar and the install PTS files from the NZ kit PTS directory to var NZ repl directory. So this, you can do it on the net as a host itself because um, var NZ REPL is a mounted directory, uh, so it refers to the same location on the PTS. Uh, next step, you have to save the license file, the REPL affirmation file in the directory NZ data replication on all the NetIsa hosts. And the uh, next step, you have to edit this configuration file called NZ data replication REPL PTS dot config file on that, you have to edit that line uh, where you identify the PTS host associated with that uh, appliance. So the line is uh, REPL PTS host uh, is equal to followed by the IP address or the host name of uh, PTS. So that host name or IP address uh, has to refer to the 10 gig interface and not the Ethernet interface. So you have to be very sure of that. And uh, all the NPS replication CLI commands are in the NZ kit bin ADM directory. So if it is not already in the path, uh, you have to make sure that it is in the path uh, environment variable for the NZ user. So 
that is on the uh, NPS host. So on the PTS host, uh, so earlier you have copied uh, the install PTS and the PTS.tar files from the NPS host onto the PTS host. So you you have to first you have to log on to the PTS host as root, go to the directory wall in the ripple, and it is as simple as executing that script install PTS. So that will take care of installing the whole uh, ma management software. It will create uh, these uh, directories under OPT, IBM, NZPTS, where all the commands are there. So after a successful installation, you have to confirm that uh, the PTS daemon is running. And you can do so by uh, running the following command, uh, service PTSD status. It will show whether it is running. It should be running by default, but uh, doesn't hurt to check. And uh, there are some uh, profile settings um, on, in a file called pts underscore profile. Uh, they are in the directory opt ibm nz pts. So you can uh, add that line to the uh, in the bash rt file, or uh, and in addition to that, you can add the directory opt ibm uh, nz pts uh, bin to the path variable. Uh, of course, you can do so by editing adding that line in the bash RC file. So now that we have installed uh, the PTS software on all the PTS hosts, you have to make sure that they are communicating. Okay. So the PTS software provides a certain uh, set of PTS commands, command line interface commands. And one of them is uh, this command called PTS configure. So you can run this command to see uh, first the information about that host. So when you execute the PTS configure minus list command on any given PTS host, it gives information about that particular uh, host. It uh, gives the node name and it gives the uh, root directory and uh, uh, other information in the default port is uh, 52573 uh, there is no reason to change the default one but uh, again if there is any reason to change uh, we can deal with that in the sense I mean we have to of course discuss with support and see what they say about that um, and the next command that you can run is uh, called the PTS topology command uh, so you have to run the PTS topology command to add the PTS host to the topology. And you do so by uh, using that add flag. So you say PTS topology minus add followed by the canonical name of the PTS host. So that you have to execute on all PTS hosts individually to add them to the PTS uh, topology. So once you add all the PTS, uh, PTS hosts to the topology, you can uh, verify that information using the list flag of the same command. So it shows the details about the node, the type, uh, whether it is local or remote, uh, the status of that uh, PTS host, the ports and the clock differentials and stuff like that. So if the clock differentials are huge, uh, I have seen this before, um, if it is not any reasonable like one or two seconds, um, sometimes it displays huge numbers. That means uh, PTSs are not communicating with each other and there is something wrong with the WAN uh, setup, so you would have to work with the customer's uh, network team to figure out what the issue is. But hopefully, before even we get here, the uh, installation team would have verified the communication between uh, NPS host and the PTS host, and also between the PTS hosts. So when, when we get there and execute this command, we won't have any issues. Upgrade and downgrade, uh, I mean, uh, upgrade is uh, pretty simple. When you upgrade the NPS host, uh, you should also upgrade the PTS. So you take uh, the PTS and install PTS software uh, from um, that um, distribution, move it over to the PTS, and execute install PTS. So downgrade, uh, I've not done a downgrade um, so far because we have only 608 and 7 so far. But um, as far as I know, downgrade should be, again, as simple as just executing the install PTS software. But um, 
again, we are told that we need to run PTS export setup program to create a script to recreate the PTS, then uninstall. So uh, again, I didn't get a chance to run these commands or downgrade yet, but uh, at least these are the instructions for downgrade. But I don't, I don't think uh, it will be any different from uh, an upgrade. Okay. And especially given that the PTS software distributed with 6.0.8 and uh, 7.0 is pretty much identical. There are not many changes. And the next uh, version of uh, replication, I, I don't think it is planned for the next six months or higher. So we don't have to worry we have about a, it. We have a question too. Is how much time does it take to upgrade? Oh, it's very minimal. Um, I have done it in like five minutes. Install Installation or upgrade should take less than five minutes. If there are no issues, of course. <laughs> okay. So once you install uh, the PDS um, software, it, uh, you, it, it gives uh, certain CLA commands. I'm going to uh, talk uh, list those commands here. So the first command is uh, the PDS configure command. So you, you can use this uh, command for various configuration capabilities uh, on, on the local PDS node including adding, modifying directory information, displaying configuration details, etc. Uh, you can use the PTS topology command to manage the replication topology of uh, distributed PTS nodes, uh, which PTS nodes replicate to each other, this information. Okay, so I've, seen, I've shown you the example of what uh, PTS topology displays earlier. PTS replication command, you can use that to control the starting and stopping of uh, replication between PTS nodes for any reason, if you want to do that. And uh, you can use uh, the PTS status command to check the status of, uh, to look at the status and operational metrics information of uh, replication. You can use the, this command to see latency, disk usage, and whatnot. And of course, PTS rev displays the current software revision information about this PTS node. PTS recover, uh, you can use this command to recover files between local PTS hosts from other PTS hosts in the topology. So to answer an earlier question, if a PTS node goes down, you could use this command to recover any lost uh, transaction logs if they are available on other PTSs. If they are not, <laughs> then it is a little bit more involved, so which I'm going to talk about. Okay. And of course, with uh, 608 and higher, you will you also get uh, commands to support replication on the NPS host. Uh, so all the replication commands on the NPS host start with NZ REPL. Uh, NZ REPL state command provides information about the current state of the replication system. NZ REPL prune PTS command. This, can, this command can be used to remove obsolete uh, replication log files from the PTS. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, at a minimum configuration, you have uh, 3.9 terabytes. In maximum configuration, you have 10 terabytes. So of course, that is limited space. So depending on how much uh, the size of the replicated databases and how much data that you transfer over uh, on an incremental basis, these uh, transaction logs can get bigger. So, uh, I mean, if eventually you will run out of space. So you can use this NZ REPL prune PTS command to prune the transaction logs. NZ REPL analyze command, uh, this command determines what data must be transferred to recover or initialize a subordinate node. So it creates a recovery file for subsequent use by NZ REPL backup or NZ REPL restore. So NZ REPL backup command, uh, you can use this command to backup all the data required to re recover or uh, initialize a subordinate node. And the corresponding command is uh, NZ REPL restore. Um, the command restores all the data required to recover or uh, initialize a subordinate node. NZ REPL show SQL, uh, you can use this command to display SQL statements in the replication log. NZ REPL override CSI, 
this command can be used to skip over a replicated transaction on the subordinate. So if uh, you see that uh, the, the subordinate is hung upon any particular transaction for any reason, and uh, you see that uh, that particular transaction may not be necessary <laughs> um, uh, for keeping these uh, databases in sync, you can choose to o override that particular CSI and CSN and uh, move over to the next transaction on subordinate. NZ ripple fork, uh, this command uh, YouTube, this command can be used to recover from something called a transaction fork. Okay, so what transaction fork is and, and the details I'm going to talk about in detail in further. But this command will be used in those cases. Any questions so far uh, before we move on to setting up replication? Um, there's one. It says, what user ID executes the replication CLI commands, NZ or root? You will use uh, the NZ command to execute the NZ REPL uh, statements. Okay. They are in the NZ kit bin uh, ADM directory, so you would use uh, the NZ user. So now that we have uh, installed the PTS management software and uh, we have seen what commands are available, we are all uh, ready, uh, meaning uh, we have checked the communication between PTSs and the NPS to PTS communication. The next step is to uh, enable replication between these hosts. Uh, so the first thing uh, to do is on the master side. So on the master NPS host, uh, there are certain commands that you need to execute to start. Okay? So the first step is uh, to set a node name for the master. And uh, you do so by executing this command, set replication node name, and you have to give a um, name for the master node. So this is different, or it can be seen, of course, as the host name of uh, the master node. So it is, uh, this node is uh, only for replication purposes. Okay, so that's something that uh, you would is easy to configure, that's all. Uh, so the next step is to create a replication set. And you do so by this command, create replication set, and you give a replication set name. Um, and you have to assign the role master to this master node. Um, you do so by uh, this command, create replication node, triple set dot master name, role master. So this command, when you execute this command, the master role is assigned to that node. And you can alter the master node to state active using this command. Alter replication node, ripple set, master name, state active. So that activates the master node and it allows uh, update transactions against the replicated data. So, so by, the, by now, we would have identified all the subordinate nodes. So before uh, anything, um, for each subordinate host to be added, we have to back up all the global data uh, using the NZ backup minus global option. Uh, so we have to do this on all subordinate nodes and move it over to the master nodes and restore global data on the master using NZ restore minus global. So that will replicate all the users and privileges and all the other stuff on the master node. And once the replication is active, you cannot add any users or any global data on any subordinate node. Okay, so before you start, you uh, make sure that global data is the same on master as all the subordinates. So this ensures that subordinate hosts do not have global objects that are not present on the master. Uh, and uh, add each database to be replicated to the replication set. Uh, this must be done before adding any subordinate nodes. Uh, so before you do so, you can alter any existing databases uh, and you can add them to the replication set. So you do alter database, database name, replication set, and you give the replication set name that you created earlier. And the next step, is to uh, create subordinate nodes. 
So you do so by adding uh, create replication node tuple set dot subordinate name role subordinate. So you execute this command on the master. Okay. So on the master you have information about uh, subordinate nodes as well. So this is what you do on the master side to start with. Uh, sorry. So to and the next step now that you have uh, added these databases to the replication set, you, you can use the nzrepl analyze command to see what all needs to be backed up on the master node and uh, restored on the subordinate node. So you can run the NZ, nzrepl analyze command using this uh, recovery file flag. Uh, so it creates a recovery file that has information about what needs to be backed up and you will pass that recovery file to this uh, NZ REPL backup command. Uh, so you do NZ REPL backup minus recovery file, uh, that recovery file created earlier, and you can give a backup destination. So that backup destination can be anything. Uh, it is a network mount, or you can e you can even use PTS uh, to transfer data from the master to um, the subordinate uh, for initial for initialization. Again. Uh, so you have to keep in mind the size of uh, the PTS, um, so PTS, so PTS uh, sorry, available disk space on the PTS is a minimum of 3.6, maximum of 10 terabytes. So if it falls within that, you can use um, the PTS to PTS for initialization. If it is not, then we have to devise a solution for that. Okay. And after that, after, now that the master is active, you can create any new databases uh, that are part of the replication set using commands such as uh, create database, database name, replication set, and triple set. So that was on the master side. Now on the subordinate side, um, so as I said earlier, uh, subordinate nodes are added on the master node using that command earlier. Uh, the completed backups uh, of in the uh, REPL backup are um, shipped over to the subordinate in one way or the other, either do, doing a mount or something else. And if it is larger than 10 terabytes, one mode is to truck mode. You can actually ship the backups on tapes or whatever onto the subordinate node and restore it. So once uh, they are on the subordinate node, first you have to give a node name for the subordinate. And uh, you can do that by executing this command, set replication node name, uh, the sub name. And the subordinate node name here must match the one that you added on the master. Okay. So you can add that name. You can uh, you need to wait uh, 5 to 10 seconds and uh, you can run this query. Select node ID from uh, underscore v underscore replication underscore my node. So this should show the node name that you just added. So you are once it displays a nominal value, it has been added to the system. Uh, next, you you have to get the recovery file and a set of uh, the backups that you created using in the REPL backup from the master and uh, run the following command to restore the backups created in the master. You do so by uh, NZ REPL restore minus recovery file. You specify that recovery file name. And make sure that they are in sync, uh, the databases are in sync. And uh, you activate uh, the subordinate uh, using this command, alter replication node, REPL set dot sub name, state active. So this enables replicated update transactions from master to be processed on the subordinate node. So um, <clears throat> that is one method of uh, initializing a subordinate node, uh, meaning uh, um, an existing database. Alternately, you can uh, do, b before you start, you can take a backup using the normal backup in the backup of all the databases that you want to back up. So you take a backup of all those databases and uh, you drop or uh, rename those uh, existing databases, meaning this is before adding them to the replication set. 
Okay, so you can rename or drop those databases. Um, you have to create new databases with those same names. So create database DB name replication set. Uh, add them to the replication set, and uh, you can restore the back uh, these databases from the backups that you just created. So you can do so by normal uh, NZ restore command. You can give options. The source database is uh, whatever you use to backup, and the database. So this way, uh, you can take a backup, and as they are being restored into these databases, since they are uh, just update transactions, they will be replicated over to the subordinate. Okay. So if you don't want to, if the van is too slow, I mean, of course, you, you have to go to the van, but if you don't want to the truck mode and if the databases are huge, this is uh, one consideration. Okay. This is one thing that you can consider for, um, for initializing a subordinate node. So, um, since we uh, use a SQL uh, method, right, SQL uh, replication log method, it is very important that the databases on the master and subordinate are identical before uh, we execute any replicated transactions over, uh, replicated transactions. So you can uh, do consistency checks using normal nz underscore checksum that uh, mark phrase strips, uh, or this replication uh, tool provides a um, tool called nz underscore md5 underscore qsum. This is a utility and that, that can be used to check consistency also. So first thing, of course, you can use uh, system views such as uh, vReplication sync. That can be used to determine if the subordinate has caught up with the master. But again, that is after <laughs> the replication is um, active. But before that, you can use uh, the nz underscore md5 underscore qsim utility to determine if um, databases uh, contents of the tables are in sync across multiple netizen nodes. So uh, this is a UDX and this has to be installed. The installer is available in, in that uh, directory that I show there in the nz kit bin adm tools nz qsum directory. To do to install, you extract the tar file using the tar xvf uh, nz underscore md5 underscore qsum dot tar file, and uh, you run the install qsum dot perl script with a valid username and password, and that will install that UDF uh, for you. And, and the way this works, uh, this tool uh, works is uh, it is a inline uh, function. So you execute select uh, nz underscore md underscore md5 underscore qsum, and you pass a select statement to that. Okay. So you can pass a select star from a uh, table to that uh, UDF, and the command returns a unique checksum value uh, for that uh, table. So you can execute this command for all the tables in your uh, replicated databases on, a, on both the master and subordinate to make sure that uh, they are identical, meaning the checksums should match. So this uh, should answer an earlier question about uh, how to check consistency um, on the master and subordinate once before initialization uh, of replication. But once replication gets going, you can... Um, uh, you can see the you can use this uh, system view called underscore v underscore replication underscore sync to see if master and uh, subordinate have uh, caught up. But again, I would say as a best practice, even if uh, this uh, view says that uh, you know the latest uh, transactions have been applied, every once in a while I would at least check uh, the consistency using this command to make sure that they are indeed in sync. Any questions so far? We are making good pace, guys. Uh, so I think it's been uh, over hour and a half, 15 minutes, uh, Mike. So do do you want to take a, a quick uh, break? Hello? Um, I guess question is, is how much more do we have to go? Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I have um, 
So now that we talked about uh, installation and uh, replication setup, the next step is to talk about uh, failover scenarios and uh, stuff like that. So probably another hour in this session. Okay, so this would be a good breaking point. Yeah. Um, so do we want to take a 10-minute break? Yep, and why don't you give me control back so we can stop the recording, and then we can um, restart it. Okay. And uh, how do I do that? Uh, as soon as you stop sharing, I can take control back. Yep. Oops, sorry. All right. And let me stop the recording. <laughs> 